God is good, amen. I'm so glad you're here this morning. Even though it was kind of rainy and thundery outside and it wasn't the most pleasant weather to get out, I'm glad that you battled your way through your temptation to stay home and watch Sports Center. Or to go visit bedside assembly with Pastor Sheets. <laughs> this comforter that's in this service is better than that comforter. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. And I want to read one verse, verse 18. First Corinthians 14, 18. Paul says this to the letter that he writes to the Corinthians. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. Lord God, have your way in this service. Thank you for your precious presence that's in this service already. And Lord, I pray that you would minister to every single heart here today. Touch them, Lord, as only you can. And let your Holy Spirit move in this place. Minister to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God for the wonderful moving of the Holy Spirit in the last Sunday service. I understand there were a couple of people saved, two or three people baptized in the Holy Spirit, many refilled. I even understand after the fact that there was at least one healing, maybe two. Stephanie, can I bring you the mic real quick? Would you do that? I know I didn't ask you, and this is totally, she's going, what? But I, I, I want her to just take a minute and tell you what she told me when I called to check on Isabella this week. It's funny, I have a feeling you're going to do this. <laughs> uh, he called and asked me how Isabella was doing. Last Sunday morning she woke up and had really bad pain in her side, felt really sick. So we took her to the, the doctor in this church. And uh, they said, well, we can't find anything, nothing's going on, they just sent us home. So we went home, put her on the couch, let her rest. Um, about 12 o'clock rolled around and she stood up and she said, I feel great, I feel pumped. <laughs> we were like, well, you've been really sick so you need to lay down and rest. And she said, no, I feel great, I feel normal, nothing's wrong. And just started playing. And all morning she'd been laying around not feeling good. Well, a little while later, I was talking to uh, Benita, a dear sweet friend of mine, and she said, well, how's Isabella? And I said, she's doing great. And she said, well, we prayed for her at church. And I didn't even know that her name had been mentioned. I didn't even text Pastor Steve or get a chance to talk to him that morning. And she said, I didn't even realize it was Isabella. You're Isabella until later. And I, so I said, well, thank you for praying for her. And I got thinking about it a little while later. And I told Isaac, I said, she was just completely healed. Because at 12 o'clock is when she stood up and said, I'm, I'm good, I'm great, I'm pumped, I feel good. It was completely gone at 12 o'clock. And I know that the service here last Sunday is already praying. And it was a wonderful Holy Ghost service that did it. Amen. 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 I think that's about the time when I got to the list of people that were sick at the end of the service and mentioned Isabella's name and Stephanie Kate Caldwell told me that Isabella was sick so you know it pays to let the church family know what's going on so we can pray for one another and be there for one another so I'm just believing that the Lord heard our prayers even in the midst of the service and touched a little girl on the couch in her home. Amen. God is wanting to breathe the fresh breath of heaven into his body the church. A fresh fire, a fresh anointing and zeal. Why is that? Because it's the last days. Church, I believe we're living in the last days. 
I know Joel said that in the last days he would pour out his spirit, so that started on the day of Pentecost. The last days actually started 2,000 years ago, but in the concept of eternity and time, that's the last days. But we're in those final part of the last days, and so we need that freshness, that closeness, that intensity, that passion in our lives, do we not? I also believe that many, many people are lost and Jesus is coming soon and they need to be saved. And thirdly, I think the Holy Spirit has been benched long enough. The church has tried more fashionable and, quote, less threatening techniques to reach our culture. But sadly, these have not brought the great revival and change in our culture that was planned for. It's time to give the Holy Spirit the starting position, the team captain honor that He deserves in our churches. Amen. Church, we must humble ourselves and repent and seek times of refreshing that He wants to bring. Now that the last thing, God's perfect will is that every believer be full of the Holy Spirit. As I said last Sunday, when we neglect this gift, it's like leaving a great Christmas present unopened and unappreciated under the tree. If you were here last Sunday, you know what I'm talking about. Let's not neglect what God has given us, what Jesus said, I must go away so that He can come. Meaning the Holy Spirit. Remember what Luke chapter 11 says. He says, And so I tell you, keep on asking, you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Amen. Amen. Peter calls this experience times of refreshment or times of re refreshing from the presence of the Lord. And it's, it's found in Peter's second sermon. You know, Peter's first sermon on the day of Pentecost resulted in 3,000 people being saved. Well, his second sermon, a couple of chapters later, came after that he and John ministered, or yeah, he and John ministered to the lame man at the gate beautiful. Remember, they were on their way to prayer at the time of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they passed the man who had been laid by the gate there for 38 years, and all of a sudden the man at the gate said, hey, Look at me. And Peter turned at him and said, Silver or gold I don't have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. He took him by the hands. The man stood up and began jumping and leaping and praising God. And then Peter got another opportunity to preach as the people gathered around there. And so let's look at that. It says that... Uh, Peter saw the opportunity. This is Acts chapter 3 and verse 12. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power and godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, who has brought glory to His servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release Him. You rejected this holy, righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised Him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. And then he goes on to say, Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. But God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Verse 19, now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Verse 20, then times of refreshment. Everybody say, times of refreshment. Times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. And He again will send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. Times of refreshment. Hallelujah. He is describing salvation followed by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And He calls it times of refreshing. Like a cool drink of water when you've been out in the hot sun pushing the lawnmower. How many of you have been out mowing the yard or riding on the tractor doing some kind of hard work and the sun's shining and it's hot and your wife 
brings you a big glass of water. I mean, you can just sit there and guzzle it down. It is very, very refreshing. Hallelujah. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit is like. He's like a tall glass of water on a hot day. Can I get a good amen? Amen. We need that times of refreshment. I've got kind of got a sermon within a sermon this morning. And so this is the this is the little sermon within the big sermon. Okay? I just take a few minutes to tell you this. Um, three things I see in these verses that I just read to you. Number one, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not a man-made experience. Not man-made. Verse 20 said. These times of refreshments will come from the presence of the Lord. Literally from the face of the Lord. In Acts 1.4, it talks about until the Father sends you the gift He promised. In Acts 2.3, suddenly there came a sound from... From where? From heaven. It wasn't a sound from earth, but certainly wasn't a sound from hell. But a sound from heaven... This experience is from heaven. Man didn't invent it. God did. And He gave it as a gift. Everybody say gift. Yeah. It's a life-changing encounter with the living God known as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now somebody I, from time to time gets up, uh, confused and says, You're, are you saying, Pastor, that you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues before you can go to heaven? No. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what takes you to heaven. The baptism in the Holy Spirit was not to send you, not sent to get you to heaven. It was sent to help you get others to heaven. It was sent to empower you to be a bold witness. That's why we need, that's why Jesus said, don't you leave Jerusalem, apostles, until you are good with power from on high. Because you're going to need me to be able to do the job that I've called you to do, to go and reach the world. So if the Holy Spirit is not about us being saved, it's about empowering us to help save others. Hallelujah. But it's, it's, it's necessary. God never intended for just a little faithful few people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and the rest of the people not. I want to tell you, God's will is that every believer be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so we should hunger after that, seek after that, knock after that, ask and believe so that God will empower us with that. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is not a dry, unemotional experience. It's a time of refreshing. It's not a dead sea of meaningless talk, but a river of living water, as it says in John 37 and 38. John 7, 37 and 38. Pentecost is supposed to be a powerful, vibrant, and supernatural linking to the Spirit of God, to the Spirit, soul, and body of man. The Spirit quenches our thirst like cool water. He refreshes us like a gentle rain, like we saw this morning. He's a life-giving river, and He blows like a cool breeze. How many of you that yesterday afternoon kind of like that cool breeze that suddenly come in? Actually, I guess it was more Friday night. We were up at Piedmont at the football game. We got there, the sun was shining. It wasn't hot, but it wasn't like cold. And all of a sudden, about halfway through the game, all of a sudden the wind came up and that cool breeze, it was like, ah. That's what the Holy Spirit, he's the, ah. Can you do that with me? Ah. That's good. Try it one more time. Ah. You're good. You're good. You're real good. I say bring it on. I say bring him on. Amen. Blow us away, Lord. Into the fields that are wide of the harvest. Light us up to lift up Christ in our generation. Hallelujah. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, thirdly, is not a one time experience. How many of you like that? I talked about the tall glass of water on a hot day after you mowed the yard. How many of you would be satisfied if that was only a one time thing? Well, I was 15. My dad asked me to mow the yard, and my mother brought out a big, nice glass of water, and it was so good. I mowed the yard 150,000 times since, and never had another drink like that. <laughs> it don't even make sense if we compare it. We like that refreshing. I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit is meant to be that life-giving water, that tall glass of water 
that we need that will quench us and refresh us and fill us with this peace and power. Amen. Amen. Time, verse 20 said that times, not time, it's not singular, it's plural. Times of refreshment may come from heaven. Once is never enough. We get to be filled over and over and over and over again with love and power and the presence of God. In the New Testament, you see many fillings after the initial outpouring in Acts 2. In Peter, with Peter, you see him filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, 4. He's filled with the Spirit in Acts 4, 8. They're filled again in Acts 4, 31. The Ephesians are filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 19, 6. But in Ephesians 5, 18, it talks about being filled again as he wrote the letter to them to be filled and keep on being filled. We must keep on asking. We must keep on seeking. We must keep on knocking. Amen. Now that was kind of the sermon within a sermon. Now we can get to the real sermon. That one wasn't bad though, was it, Donna? All right. Pentecostal people and churches are distinguished by many things. One of the things, and we kind of talked about this, I think, a little bit last Sunday. I can't quite remember what all I said. But one of the things, the hallmarks and distinctives of a Pentecostal person, Pentecostal churches, is they seem to have a lot of fervency and zeal. That they're full of the Spirit. I've seen some, seen some Pentecostal people that weren't very fervent or zealous. It's, you know why? Because they leaked. <laughs> they were no longer full. The thing about us as humans... God fills us with the Spirit, but He knows that we leak. He knows that eventually it evaporates and leaks out. The problems of this world seem to drain us. And all of a sudden we feel like, I don't give a rip about the church or the lost just getting through this day. We leak. So we got to be filled again. Peter had to be filled again. The disciples had to be filled over and over again. But a full... Pentecostal person and church that's filled with the Spirit, they have fervency, they have zeal, they have exciting and passionate worship and praise. There's anointed preaching and teaching. There's prayer for the sick resulting in healings and miracles. There's great altar services. I love great altar services. I'll tell you, we don't have as great altar services as I remember growing up. We need better altar services. We come down and do this. We go back to our chair. Boom, 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 boom. That wasn't, that wasn't what got my attention when I was growing up. Tony, were you raised in altar services like that? Uh, he's a preacher's kid. I mean, people down there praying. And you know what? It also got loud. People were praying. Oh, God. I mean, it's like a hurricane in the front of the church. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you see that much anymore? We don't. we got to get more full of spirit. I know I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit is gauged by loudness. But there's a fervency. There's a passion. There's a zeal. There's an intensity in prayer that I think we've lost. And I'm, I'm not trying to come down on all of us because you know what? I'm coming down on Steve Lance too. We just need to get back to that type of passion and prayer and intensity in the altar. Another hallmark of a Pentecostal church is concern for the lost at home and abroad. Concern for people's salvation. They're missions minded. And there's others. But another aspect of a Pentecostal church is one that we call speaking in tongues or praying in the Spirit. How many have ever heard of that? Well, good, because you know what? I was, I was saved in the Nazarene church in Enid, Oklahoma, and until I was 11 years old, if the preacher would have asked that in the Nazarene church, how many have ever heard of speaking in tongues? I would have said, what is that? I don't we all speak with our tongue? <laughs> I'm serious. I did not ever hear of that. So the fact that you've heard of that 
It's good. I'm glad I got saved at Nazarene Church. I'm thankful for that church. I'm thankful for those prayer words. I'm thankful for those Sunday school teachers and all those people that had a vital part of my life. But I'm glad I learned there was more. I'm glad I learned there was another gift. I'm glad I learned that Jesus has more blessings, more gifts under the tree for this person. Hallelujah. That's another hallmark of a Pentecostal church is they're speaking in tongues. And sometimes people don't understand it. Our family, and I've told you this before, I think I even told it last Sunday. We didn't understand it, but you know, something was real that drew us, drew us back. There was a presence. There was a power. Something just pulled us back even though our family had no clue what on earth those people were doing. Praying in the Spirit. Speaking in a language unlearned by the speaker. How many of you speak English? How many of you can speak in another language fluently besides English? Raise your hand. There's some of you can. Okay, there's three or four. I know, I know Benny can speak French. I heard I went to school with some guys that spoke French, but it wasn't the same kind. <laughs> Benny's French is much better. I took two years of Spanish in high school. I was actually the vice president, but about all I can say now is hola and como esta. <laughs> Taco bueno, that's about it. I don't know how they elected me vice president of the Spanish club. That's the biggest joke of 79. <clears throat> but by the Holy Spirit, I have spoken in another language that I didn't know how to speak in. That's miraculous, folks. That's a miracle. If someone were here and were to come to me and say, Steve, would you stand up here and speak in perfect Arabic or something. They would say, okay, start talking in Arabic. I would say, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to speak it. A few years ago, we were at youth camp. Oh, it was kids' camp. And there was a young lady down at the altar. I never forget, it was at Turner Falls Camp. And I, I, I can still see the scene in my eyes. She was standing over to the, on the right side, if you're in the back. She was standing right here. She had her arm raised like that. I was sitting right over there. And there were some other people standing. All of a sudden, this little girl, about 11 years old, she just was, had her hands raised. And all of a sudden, she started speaking in tongues. I didn't know what she was saying. I mean, it was just sounded like gibberish to me. It didn't make any sense to me because I didn't know what she was saying. All of a sudden, there was a lady who was a counselor that week who was home from her... Uh, she, she'd been a missionary and done some mission work in another country, and she knew that language. All of a sudden, she'd come up and she said, that little girl is speaking, and I can't remember what it was. Like, it was like perfect French or Spanish or something, whatever it was. No, it was, it was either Korean or Japanese or something like that. She says, that little girl is speaking perfect Korean. And she was glorifying God and talking about people to get right with God. And so on. And she was speaking. Her. That little girl had no clue on earth what she was saying. But the Holy Spirit was speaking to her. That's supernatural. That's the Holy Spirit in action. And you know what? That's also a sign that that little girl's saved. Because uh, you don't do that unless you're saved. Hallelujah. So it was a great sense of uh, encouragement to her that the, the Lord anointed her. But what a miracle to see that like that. And so speaking in tongues and, and, and praying in the Spirit is, is, is hallmark to Pentecostal churches. And we need to get back to that. We need to emphasize that. Well, well what good is it? I want to give you quickly this morning eight reasons. Sorry, Jerry, I don't have 26, but I got eight. Eight reasons you should be speaking or praying in tongues every day. Every day. Not once a year. Every day. Number one, because speaking in tongues is the biblical sign of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's a recurring sign and throughout the book of Acts. Anytime a person was baptized in the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. 
When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will know it. So don't be cheated out of the real thing. Someone once asked, do I have to speak in tongues to be filled with the Spirit? The preacher answered, you are asking the wrong question. The right question is, do I get to speak in tongues? Speaking in tongues is a wonderful privilege of every Spirit-filled believer. It's a wonderful privilege. Number two, because praying in tongues builds you up spiritually. Like our physical bodies, our spirit needs exercise. One form of spiritual exercise is praying in tongues. It helps. It keeps you in tune. Yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before, I was in my truck and there was a song playing on the radio. I wasn't speaking in tongues, but I was singing along with the song. And I was just singing. I was sitting at a red light. I glanced in the mirror behind me and the lady behind me was singing the exact same song. It was so cool. I thought, wow, she's listening to 88.9. She's listening to K-11. We were, so I was watching her lips and she was singing right along with her. I thought that was so cool. How cool would that be if I'd been praying in the Holy Spirit? I looked behind me and somebody else was praying in the Spirit. Hallelujah. I, 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 for, for Father's Day this year, my kids got me a Fitbit. It tells me how fit I am. <laughs> and it lies a lot. <laughs> it tells me I have taken 4,475 steps today. That my heart rate ooh, is 117. <laughs> that I have walked 2.14 miles. That I've burned 1,577 calories. I think what the fire means. And there's one more it's about steps. Where is it? I'm taking one step. That's a lie, but I've been down this thing five times. <laughs> this, the goal is to try to get you to take 10,000 steps a day, is what they like. And you know, that, that, and I try to hit that. I'll try to, if I'm short, I'll try to go out and do some more walking. I wonder what our spiritual Fitbit would say if we had one strapped to our. Praying in the Spirit today? No, it was 12 years ago. Have you witnessed anybody today? No, oh, that was 12 years ago too, right? I got filled with the Spirit. Have you prayed today? Well, that was last week over your chicken strips. Yeah. <laughs> what would our spiritual Fitbit say? Something to think about. We need to be built up spiritually. Just as we are concerned about our physical body, which is going to pass away, which is not going to live forever, this body is going to turn back to dust. Praise God, i got a new one coming. It's a lot more fit than this one. It's going to last forever. But what? The spiritual is always more important than the temporal. Always more important. People get so wrapped up in the material things. My heart was so sad this week when I heard this man up in Michigan or Wisconsin or somewhere that created a Facebook for nurses. Did you see this? He was like 46 years old and he went and took a shotgun. I don't mean to be graphic, but he killed all three of his kids and his wife. And they lived in a multi-million dollar house. Just goes to show that money doesn't buy everything. So many people get wrapped up in getting more and containing more, build a bigger house, have more stuff. I want to tell you, stuff does not make life. It's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the spiritual that makes life. Number three, speaking in tongues is a powerful God-given means of intercessory prayer. Romans 8, 26-27. Says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. The Holy Spirit helps us pray in the perfect will of God. We don't know what we should, how to pray at times. The Spirit will help us pray. The Holy Spirit will pray through us with groans and words that words cannot express. He will pray through us according to the will of God. You begin to pray and you allow the Spirit to take over. Sometimes there are needs you don't know about. 
And sometimes there are needs that you know about, but you don't know how to pray for them. Oh yeah. So yield to the Spirit of God and allow Him to pray through you. You're praying in the perfect will of God. Number four, because praying in tongues creates an awareness of God's indwelling presence. The Bible gives us wonderful promises of God's presence. Matthew 28, 20 says, And I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Praying tongues is a wonderful remedy for this problem of not feeling the presence of God. If you're down, you say, boy, I just don't feel God. God feels like He's in this 18th heaven today. He's not near me. The heavens are brass. You ever been there when you feel like your, your, your prayer is going about this tall? You start praying in the Spirit and all of a sudden, God comes near. All of a sudden, you feel that presence of the Lord. Start singing. All of these things are tools to get us in the presence of God. God inhabit the praises of His people. Number five, praying in tongues will build up your faith. Jude 20 says, But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy ghost, or in your most holy faith, praying in the power of the Holy Ghost or in the Holy Spirit. You can build up your faith through reading and practicing the Word of God by exercising faith, but one often neglected way is by praying in tongues. You can just pray in the Spirit and it will build you up. It's like doing exercise. Number six, because praying in tongues is a way to wrap yourself in the love of God. We sing the song, Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. And it's true, whether I feel it or not, I know that Jesus loves me. But how wonderful to experience the love of God. Because, as I said this last Sunday, you don't always go on feelings. They say don't go on feelings, but sometimes the Holy Spirit lets us feel what we're going on. We get that presence, that love of God. Prayer and the Spirit helps us keep ourselves in God's love. Paul's trials demanded this gift. He was stoned. He was, he was run out of town. He was put in prison. All these things kept him in, in need of being built up in his spirit so that he could in turn write the letters that we have if, in the New Testament to build us up in our times of trial. Number seven, because together with the gift of interpretation, it is one way God communicates a prophetic word to his church. Sometimes God wants to speak directly to a congregation through the gifts of tongues and interpretation. At such times, the church is edified and built up. When someone speaks in tongues in a public worship service, as we have here quite often, then the gift of interpretation will come forth to interpret what was said. That's God's way of moving among His people and speaking what's on His heart and mind for that service or for those people. Last Sunday, we had a couple of messages in tongues, and I had one person come to me and said, I was so thankful for that word in, uh, in message in tongues this morning. I so needed to hear that. I felt like God was speaking right to me. Praise God. Praise God for that. But you don't have to be in a public worship service to speak in tongues. You can pray in your spirit, in your car, in your bed, while you're working. While you're mowing the grass. We keep coming to mowing the grass. What is that? You can pray in the Spirit. Since, since preparing for these messages, I have to confess it. I've been trying to pray in the Spirit more every day. I've been doing that. As I'm walking somewhere, I start saying, I don't know what I'm saying, but the Lord does. And I know that He knows my heart is trying to reach out to Him, build myself. I've been trying to pray more and more. Church, let's get a hold of this. And if you're not baptized in the Spirit so you can do that, say, God, fill me. Lord, I ask, I believe, I receive. In Jesus' name, I thank you for baptizing me in the Holy Spirit. Filling me with your Spirit so that I can pray in the Spirit. Number eight, I think. Because praying in tongues provides a perfect channel for joyous praise and worship. Have you ever been so filled with joy and happiness and gratitude that you could find no words to express that joy? You're just so happy. Yeah. Prayer and praise 
in tongues is a perfect means to express that joy and that gratitude to the Lord. John chapter 4, as I close, musicians come. John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well and they get to talking about worship. The, the woman is asking about worship and Jesus replies, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about it, for salvation comes through, Jew, through the Jews. Verse 23, But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's a way of worship. Joyous worship. In conclusion, just let me ask you this. Is it any wonder why Paul said, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than all of you? Is it any wonder that he said that? After all these things, is it any wonder that he said, I speak in tongues more than all? He wasn't bragging. He wasn't trying to say that like, look at me. He was getting them to see the importance of praying and depending and walking and living in the Spirit of God every day. Every day. 